like I said, I don't understand that yet. I don't know how it works. So I don't know how much the models like Oakland and, and some other places where it's pretty clear that the lineups are being sent down from above. Um, I, I don't know how that works. I, I, I just don't, I, 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 you know, it'd be interesting to um, get with Bob Melvin, for example, mm-hmm. out there in Oakland and say, okay, tell me how it works. What do you, how do you feel about it? What do you think? You know, I, I, cause he's a great baseball guy and it would be real interesting to, you know, to, to know, off the record, how how somebody like that feels about you right. know, about uh, stuff like that's that's happening. So, I'm certainly not against the analytics. I'm all for the analytics. They they make an awful lot of an awful lot of sense to me. Um, there's a long way to go with analytics. Uh, I was having a conversation on an airplane this year uh, with one of the key um, members of the analytics squad uh, for the Twins, and you know, talking about the shifting that, that's going on and um, it, they got burned that particular day by an outfield shift that was pulled the center fielder and right fielder way around toward right field. And the, um, the particular hitter uh, got a breaking ball and, and hit it into the gap in, in left center, right? And, and playing more straight away, uh, I think a play could have been made on the ball. I didn't have a problem with that because... I go with it where where, where the data says that some, right. that people hit the ball. I mean, you know me. I mean, that's I tried to do that without the analytics part, just from, from an eye test standpoint. When I when I played, uh, I moved around at shortstop more than anybody else did. But um, so I asked so I asked the, the the analyst. I said, when will it? How do you take into account what pitch is being thrown to a hitter? Right. Because for me. I get the fact that 80% of the time, 90% of the time, a guy's going to hit the ball a certain spot on the field, and that's where you want to play. But if you haven't analyzed what pitches, I mean, do you analyze what pitches that were hit over there? Mm-hmm. And, and because, you know, a, a, a breaking ball is more likely to be pulled than hit the, you know, where the players were playing. And I said, at some point in time, don't, aren't you going to, don't you have to take that into account? You know, who this pitcher is, what his breaking ball looks like, if he throws that where that, you know, hitters likely hit it. And, and it, he said that eventually they'll get there, right? And they don't have, and I said, I recognize that this is in its infancy, that you probably don't have anywhere near the sample size of this particular hitter uh, on breaking balls. And where does, he, where does he hit a breaking ball with two strikes? You know, that kind of thing. And he said, "Yeah, that's a, that's one of the one of the things that we're going to get to." He said, "We just have to keep inputting data all the time about you know where guys hit the ball, and, they, and we're you know we're going to get there at some point in time. But in the meantime, you know we kind of are looking at you know where does he likely hit it, and that's where we have to play. And so I I get that, but I also see that analytics to be." You know, if I were the shortstop, for example, in that uh, in that particular instance, I know I'm supposed to play up the middle. But if I see breaking ball called, right, I'm uh, as the pitch is being thrown, I'm moving, I'm moving toward the pull side. You know, I'm moving back that way because the chances are the guy's going to pull the ball, right? And so there's there's a lot of things in the game that are going to need to be uh, taken into account as the data is continuing to be mined. Right. And, you know, I, that's what I find fascinating is that, you know, having grown up watching Earl Weaver and, you know, you, you obviously uh, had Mr. Mock to talk about things about. These people all included analytics. They didn't have maybe that number of decimal points, but they all included this kind of analytical thinking. But it came as much out of observation and situation as math, you know. So, no question. You know, so, you know, Cal Ripken played where he thought the ball was going to hit based on what the hitter did, but also on the situation in the game, what he knew the pitcher was going to throw. And it's tough for analytics to accomplish all of that while a guy's standing at shortstop. Right. Pitch right. to pitch. It is. And, you know, I, I cut my teeth uh, defensive positioning with Mock uh, when we sit with the, the pitcher and the catcher mm-hmm. and him and me. And and, uh, and I, I've mentioned this in the past that we would have – that a particular the game last night had been charted by the pitcher for the next day, 
and uh, he would write down what the count was, where the ball was hit, and what the pitch was. And he would draw a little line in these little uh, diamonds that we had, and we had pages and pages and pages of them uh, for our pitcher against against the opposing hitters. And, and we could look at those and say, well, okay, well, I mean, fastballs tend to go here and breaking balls tend to go there. And, and you know, how are you going to pitch them? And, you know, we would make up our, our positioning accordingly. In like manner, when I played shortstop for the Yankees and, and uh, Greg Nels was playing third and Ron Guidry was pitching, that devastating slider to right-handers, you know, the back foot slider, the classic back foot slider, maybe the first back foot slider designated pitch, right? It was Ron Guidry's wipeout slider that he had. And I had a deal worked out with Nettles one when I saw, it, you know, the third baseman can't see the sign, but I can at shortstop. And the, the three went down for the slider. And as, as Gator was delivering the pitch, I would move toward the third base line and I'd go, I go, let's go, Greg. You know, and Greg, and Greg would hear that and he'd move toward the line. He wanted to know... Because uh, he'd play off the line for you know, most of the time, but when that slider was coming, he would move toward the line, because, and I would move toward the hole, because that's where the ball, if it was hit on the ground, it was going that way. Mm-hmm. You know, there, it it might not be hit that way, if it was uh, a hitter might not hit, uh, he might hit that slider in the air to center field. I mean, it might be anywhere else, but on the ground, it was going over there. It wasn't going on the ground up the middle, and and so, you know, we we would make those determinations based on real life experience of what mm-hmm. you know what we saw and what happened and what you know what kind of charts were available at the time. We didn't have the computer stuff and there wasn't data entry into you know computer analytics then. It was Ma could come up with a bunch of diamond uh, on pages, like nine of them, and, you know, for each hitter and it was a three ring binder for whoever it was, Yankees mm-hmm. or Brewers or whatever, and it'd be hitter by hitter against certain pitchers and and uh, that's the way we learned that. We have a new show on the network called Frozen Fantasy. It's Kevin Gorg and Dan Myers. They talk hockey, but they also talk a lot of fantasy sports. Fantasy hockey, fantasy football, a great time of the year to listen to that show. And as we start adding some newer shows, we can also offer big discounts on advertising on the network just to help those shows get started. Uh, and again, you can reach me at jsouhan47 at gmail.com. Uh, I also like to thank whizkids.tech, tech, w- excuse me, w-h-i-z-k-i-d-s dot tech, uh, let them be your chief technology ally. And, uh, you know, as, the, as their cool Minneapolis company has grown, they now have a big billboard over there on Washington Avenue, which is a, a great sign for, for everything they have accomplished. Hello, Minnesota sports fans. This is Michael Fanner, founder and CEO of WizKids. WizKids is a Minneapolis-based managed IT, hosted VoIP, and cloud services provider. Businesses today require fast response times, skilled support staff, clear communication, and technology recommendations that align with their business goals. At WizKids, we do this each and every day with our clients. When you call into our help desk for support or work with one of our higher-level engineers on a complex issue, you'll find our staff personable and ready to roll up their sleeves to help you solve your technology problems. Reach out to WizKids today to find out how we can help your business meet your technology goals. Visit us online at wizkids.tech. That's whizkids.tech. Whizkids, make it happen. So, Jimmy Butler is driving people crazy. <laughs> Odell Buck Beckham is driving people crazy. Miguel Sano is driving me crazy. You know, you played with a, as you said in your first anecdote on this show, you played with a wide variety of personalities. The, you know, the cliches you hear in sound bites on TV about everybody getting along in every major league clubhouse or every locker room aren't true. Human beings don't get along that well all the time, it just doesn't happen. When does having a when does a teammate cross the line from being annoying to being dysfunctional? At what point do you have to say, okay, this just doesn't work anymore? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I think you don't know it until it happens. Yeah. Uh, you know, with in the story about uh, our little picture there, that I, you know, mm-hmm. and, the, and I mean, <clears throat> that's classic baseball stuff. That if you find something that annoys someone, yep. then you just you know, it's like. Uh, I've got one nerve left and you're getting on it type of thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if if you find a nerve in a clubhouse, uh, boy, that nerve just gets jumped on yeah. uh, over and over again just because it's fun, you know. And and we used to laugh at how annoyed they'd get and they'd – and it was all it was all a big joke. I mean, and, and um, so – but it never got to be dysfunctional in the clubhouse. We were just – you know, we were having fun. And, and the more – 
the more somebody comments about something, the more you do it, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's just the way it is. And um, it, I, I guess you have to be, I mean, people will let you know in the clubhouse. People will let you know if it's gone too far. Right. You know, and, 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 and you know, the, and then it's, it's up to both sides to, to fix that, you know, to make sure it doesn't go, you know, further than that. And I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen that very often, you know, I mean, generally speaking, I think you, you also know early on with the, with personalities in a clubhouse, how you, it, whether or not, and with whom you can have fun and, and who right. you can't. Um, and you just kind of avoid, you don't even go there with certain personalities. It's just, but if you have those kind of personalities on the team, it's not as fun. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. You know, I mean, that's just one of those, that would be one of those locker room, you know, clubhouses you would, you would walk into as a, as a writer and you would sense that this is not one of the more cohesive clubhouses. Not that it's bad. It's just that it's not that intangible great that you, right. that you sense every once in a while. Right. And, and you know, I've had people tell me I overrate it, and I may, but I will say that, you know, I was around the when I was around Puckett and Herbeck, I could even when I saw I was around them bad years, I could see how they controlled the clubhouse, and I was around, you know, when Knobloch was the 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 dominant figure in the clubhouse at Winnebago Clubhouse, I saw great clubhouses through the 2000s, but they kind of dropped off at the end when Torrey left and it became more Nick Blackburn types and not Torrey Hunter types. So to me. Having good guys in the clubhouse doesn't doesn't win games, but I think I think it can help take a good team and make it a little bit better than it might have been otherwise. I think it has to do with comfort. We I, I think we probably made this point before as well, but uh, it, it's not a prerequisite. But if you have it, it makes everybody happier and more comfortable, and anybody's going to do their job better in that in that situation. Now that's different than saying, I had a guy say to me one time about mock, for example, you know, I just don't think he was ever going to be successful. I, I mean, I wouldn't want to, I, he's not the kind of guy you can just go have a beer with, you know, and just talk. well, that's not the manager's job. No. And the manager and Gene was, you know, fiery and insistent on uh, playing the game correctly and all those kinds of things. And so that put some heat on players, right? I mean, he was, he was going to let you know if you weren't playing the game right. He also, the thing about Gene was, I, I remember lots of times, he'd be pacing up and down the clubhouse after a, after a loss, and I thought, oh, man, we're, gonna, we're really going to, you know, he's going to lay into us. And, and he'd stop and say, I'm burning in here, guys. I'm burning. It's my fault. I, this is on me. I, I, my stomach is killing me. He says, this is on me. And, he, and he'd walk back into his uh, office and, you know, early on in my career, I was, trying to think what did he do or not do I you know it was and it really I really had to think about it because when you're playing the game you try to learn and think along as best you can but you're you're worrying about catching the ball and hitting the ball for the most part right and and uh and Gene's intensity uh any Billy Martin's intensity uh was was not comfortable all the time I don't think you have to be comfortable all the time in that way but I think it I, I because I think it's in any job, it's right to feel the tension of needing to do what you're supposed to do uh, and being called out on it if you don't. But from an interpersonal relationship standpoint with players amongst themselves, I think the, the, the comfort of having a, a great locker room presence, collective presence together is helpful. Uh, let's get your thoughts. Uh, we're not going to like break down matchups and stuff like that, but I want to get your general thoughts or any individual thoughts you might have that rise to the top about the uh, the p- baseball playoffs. Uh, once again, if you're ordering food this weekend, go to BiteSquad.com, download the Bite Squad app, use the promo code TALKNORTH, all uppercase, one word, TALKNORTH, get your first delivery free, and support the network, and uh, we, we would appreciate that. Uh, I think... MLB is hoping for a Dodgers Red Sox World Series, and I'm kind of pulling for an Astros Brewers World Series. I don't know how you feel. <laughs> uh, I don't care who's who's in it because I, the the four best teams this year uh, are are in the uh, league championship series, and um, good for them. I mean, I I, I wouldn't mind have minded. Uh, I, I don't mind. I, I I watched every 
every game that I was able to see across the board, I, I would say, am I?